You're listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense with your host, Doug Thorpe. Here's Doug. Hello again, everyone. This is Doug Thorpe, and you're listening to another episode of Leadership Powered by Common Sense. Today, my guest is going to help us understand the dynamics of having family involved in your business and uh, some of the things that might happen in a, let's call it, worst case scenario. Her name is Rachel King, and she happens to be a litigation attorney. So uh, you see where I'm going with this idea that sometimes things get really ugly. And Rachel has a lot of experience in uh, helping people in those situations. Rachel, welcome to the show. Family and business, you couldn't have said it better. Sometimes it's great and sometimes it's not so much. So I'm excited to be here and, and let's talk about it. Yes, to your point, it, it definitely happens. And it's not uncommon for the person that wants to be an entrepreneur. They've got an idea or they get an opportunity and they go at it. And one of the immediate things they run into is the need to have some more people on the team to be able to continue to grow and process whatever it is they've got going on. And it's not uncommon to turn to family to be that that help that, you know, the the spouse, the the child or the extended relative that might be available and they come in. And a lot of times they come in at a at a much reduced rate, right? Because the cash is tight and they're willing. So you take advantage of that, but then that starts to develop a, a relationship of a different kind, not the same relationship you have at the dinner table. Now it's a work relationship. And sometimes it works well and sometimes it doesn't. So first, let me ask, in, 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 as, a, as an attorney, how, how did you get into this realm of, of dealing with parties that are having difficulty with those work relationships? I opened my firm in 2014. And anybody that started a business, you know, you kind of take whatever comes through the door, right? So I, my first few cases were family law. I still do family law, divorce, custody, things like that. And But those are very highly emotional situations. A divorce is arguably one of the most stressful kinds of uh, cases a human will ever have to go through. And so when you form that kind of trust in that relationship and you get somebody successfully through their divorce process or their child custody battle, oftentimes they come back with other things. And that's sort of what happened here. I got... I, I, I own my own company. I have made the mistakes. I've learned a lot with family involved. And so I was able to kind of guide my clients that came back with these issues or that were navigating them. When we're in a divorce situation, many times there's a business where husband and wife work at that company and now what we're doing. So I think being involved in business and families was a natural part of the areas of law that I was practicing, uh, even from the very beginning. Now we fast forward to today, and I think the reason that I still do it and that I'm good at it and that I continue to get people wanting me to help is because I am really good at separating the emotions between my clients and myself. So while I'm helpful and I can advise and I can advocate and I can do all of these things, I don't go down with the ship, right? I make sure that yeah. I am able to separate myself. I'm so sorry for all of the things that you're going through, but ultimately I have a family of my own and a business of my own that I have to run. So you go cry to your emotional support system and let me help you through the legal process, through some of these uh, financial issues and all of that that we're dealing with. But because I can separate myself, I don't get burnout. And so it allows me to really be the best attorney that I can for my clients and continue providing really great representation in this specific uh, arena. Well, uh, let's talk about that. And, and number one, I agree with you totally on the on the divorce subject, uh, having been a veteran of that experience. Um, it, yeah, it, it, it is a life changing moment in, in most every case. And uh, the legal process to get there can be fairly short cycled or it can be very, a very long and painful process. But uh, uh, moving on to the business side of things, when there are family interruptions, you know, uh, you probably have many, 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 many 
many more examples. I'm thinking of cases where um, there's a founder and maybe they bring two of the children in and then it comes time for the founder to step out and step away and the two siblings don't see eye to eye on what the destiny of the company is. And let's, let's start with that scenario. What, what are some of the things that bubble up out of that dynamic where there's that kind of friction? And, and, and let's say that the handoff has already been made, the transition has already been made, founder dad is gone, and it's the two siblings that are at the helm and they get at an impasse. This could probably be its own entire episode because so many things can happen. Really, we have, uh, and part of this is going to be preventative, but the first thing that we would always look at is what are the controlling documents, right? What has already been established in this company? What did dad, we'll use your scenario, what did dad already put in place? Were there buy-sell agreements? Did the kids, are they legal owners now or the, is dad still the legal owner and they're, you know, officers of the company? So first we go to the paperwork. Hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed, dad did some kind of buy-sell agreement or some kind of legacy planning for what happens to this company or is at a place where he can shed some light on what his desires were. Oftentimes that doesn't happen though. We have a situation almost exactly like this where that happens routinely where there's a stroke or some kind of Alzheimer's or even just uh, dying and everybody's kind of forced into this. But that dynamic, if we, we, we'll assume that we have no paperwork involved, right? There is no planning, there's nothing to guide people. The biggest, and this is maybe not a shock to some, the biggest hiccup is typically the spouses of the two children. So children don't always get along, right? We know that. There are some siblings that get along great and some that don't. But really when we have this, this situation where we have two siblings that are being forced or voluntarily running a company with different ideas, not only is it emotional because it's dad's legacy and they hopefully want to do right by that by dad they also have their own ideas maybe they've always wanted to take the company public or they want it to fund their retirement or sell it right there's so many different avenues and we see people having different goals but even more than that this company typically has to provide an income for the the two siblings families and so we have outside spouses or outside forces that really have no control from a legal perspective but have a lot of control of the siblings that are you know kind of parroting over their their shoulder look we need to do this don't let your sister get away with that don't let him do that you're getting taken advantage of you work all the time and they're always out vacationing the money shouldn't be split so when we're in that situation I think it's really, really a good idea to sit, get the professionals involved, right? You need to rely at least on your CPA, get an understanding of what the financial uh, status is of this company, regardless of what the goals are. S sit down and get a real idea of what the status of the company is. See what, you know, sibling, you know, sister's goals are with the CPA. Is that realistic? See what you know, brother's ideas are with the company, is that realistic from the CPA standpoint? And then get with an attorney. And I, and here's kind of the, the real point that I think is important. Not sister gets an attorney and brother gets an attorney because now we're doing this, right? We're totally at conflict because sister's attorney is going to be representing sister, brother's attorney is going to be representing brother within their capacities, either as owners or, but, but get an attorney that represents the company, that can see what is going on and, and maybe rely on that advice. And then hopefully, I mean, there are times, quite frankly, where businesses dissolve because nobody can agree. You can't force somebody to be in business with you. There are times where the business goes bankrupt because people are fighting all the time and they're not paying attention to the company. But hopefully, 
by sitting down with a CPA, by sitting down with an attorney, by sitting down with some of these other people that have outside opinions that are not emotionally involved in this, you can set up a dynamic where there's one other decision maker, right? One person that can break the tie, that can say, you know what, I don't think we should open a second location because this one's kind of down, that's going to be a lot of cash flow, or, you know, that is a good idea, actually. I think we should really consider that. Having a tiebreaker that is not related to the family, I think is really important. And if even if you have siblings that are in conflict or family members that are in conflict, most of the time they each think they're, well, they always, 100% of the time, they think they're right. So it's not very hard of a sell, even if they're completely opposite on what they're trying to do, to have them both agree, yes, we should bring another person in. And here's why. They're so confident that they're right, they assume well, this third person is going to agree with me, so I'm going to win. So we try and put in procedures and and little things that can be agreed on so that the big decisions uh, are, are not always at the center. But I would say, keep your spouses out of it. Keep the people that are not in the business out of it. It's really hard to do, but it is probably every single time, actually, I would say I've gone to court over one of these things. It's because there's you know, a, a spouse, a friend, a, a social media lawyer, somebody else saying you should do this. And it's not always true. Yeah, it. you're right. I, I think it's those outside voices that often fuel these fires and, uh, you know, basically just trying to have good communication between the parties that are supposed to be involved in it, if it's siblings, having some ability to come together. And as you were describing that third party, I'm thinking, you know, maybe even just in the early stages, call them a mediator, you know, just to say, all right, let's, let's get everybody's ideas out on the table. Let's, let's give each side fair hearing of what it is that is driving you, what it is you're thinking about and, and, and Kind of the classic question, why? why? Why do you think that's important for the success of this business or the future of the business, I should say? And, you know, and, and I now that we're talking about it, I can think of situations where founder parent went away for whatever reason, the siblings were left with it. And one sibling decides, I think the company's in a good position. It's probably the best value we'll ever get. We ought to put it up for sale. We ought to liquidate it and and take our cash and move on. But the other party says, no, I see opportunity to grow it even more. And, you know, I'm willing to dedicate my life work to do that. And And that's where they get into the friction. And sometimes, again, in those moments, I, I've I've known of siblings that have bought each other out, you know, to say, well, okay, you don't really want to do this business. You just want cash. So let's talk about what that looks like. I'll, I'll buy your half and, you know, here you go. And absolutely amicable opportunities if they can be worked out. I agree. I think in all of the areas that I've, I mean, every time, every case I've ever had, I don't know that I've ever had two people that are out for the exact same thing. It oftentimes seems like that because how it how it's communicated, but the driving force, I call them deal breakers, are typically never the same. The situation you talked about is like best case scenario. Right. There are times that they they are unable to come to the table or a buyout doesn't really work or or who knows what's going on. And so mediation is is always a good idea because if you're in control of it. But I also think getting if you're going to do a mediator, choose a mediator who has business experience. You don't want to go get, you know, a, a longtime friend of dad that uh, that you both uh, trust to mediate. That might be a great mediator for, you know, figuring out funeral arrangements or something. But it's probably not going to be necessarily a great mediator for business because you want the person that you're having mediate this or work on it with the two of you or three of you or however many there are, to understand business concepts and to speak in a way that's not warm and fuzzies and let's, can't we all just get along kind of things. Uh, The outcome in most of these cases is that it not only affects the business health, 
whether that's long time or current value, but even more so it affects the family dynamic. And it's really, really challenging. I would say almost impossible to recover once you've gone into court to litigate. You're essentially suing your family member. And I don't know that you ever fully recover from that. So if you can get a hold of it before you're forcing litigation, then that's really helpful. And in the case that you were talking about, if they hadn't been able to come to the table and say, look, I'll buy you out and I can, then the sibling that doesn't, or the person that doesn't want to operate, they don't, again, they don't have to be forced to. But if you don't talk to them about that, you're forcing them to go into court to dissolve or get themselves out of this company. And again, once you go into court, it is really, really hard to recover from a familial standpoint. I always find it interesting, and, and I'm, I'm going to camp on that scenario a little bit longer. The, I, I found it interesting, and in my old banking days, I, I saw this happen a couple of times. You know, the one sibling wanted out, and they you know, were basically saying, let's just liquidate and cash out. And then the other says, no, I want to uh, move forward. Let's, let's try to come to terms on what it's going to take to buy you out. And even if there's wherewithal to do a, a literal 50% buyout, the one that would be receiving that money often gets contentious and says, no, that's not fair. And, and, and I'm, I always used to scratch my head and say, well, wait a minute. If you sold the business today, you're going to split it 50-50. That's, that's all there is. And, and now you're being offered a 50% stake in what is – arguably the current valuation of the business, i.e. what you would get for the business, it's the same 50%. Why are you, you know, why is that not acceptable? And it, it I, I never could understand that when I was told that one of the parties was going that direction. It, it, it just never made logical sense to me at all. And maybe that's the problem. It's not logical. It's all emotional. Well, the siblings dealing with each other is all emotional. People have very unrealistic expectations of what business values are. Uh, I think more people that own companies think their businesses are more valuable than they actually are from a buyout standpoint. So, you know, that there are those times where people are just unrealistic. But I say, you know, if we have... If I've, and I've had clients that are kind of in that exact situation, then we go to court and then the court says, okay, here's, here's the value, the court, everybody's put their evidence on, here's what the value is today. Sister, you can buy out brother for half of that interest or I'm forcing it on the open market. And that sometimes brings that other individual who thinks you know, they should be getting more back down to reality because now oftentimes, Actually, if you put it on the open market, you're going to get less because you're paying brokers, yeah. you're paying all of CPAs, all the financials, everything to close. I don't think many people realize that a business transaction actually has a whole lot of people involved and, and it costs money to sell a business. So sometimes you can get them that way and say, look, if we sell, you're going to end up paying 10% to all of these professionals and closing costs and everything, or, you know, sister buys you out and you save all of that. So you're actually getting, you know, more. And then I, of course, get the sister that says, well, but if we sold it, we'd be paying all these fees. So I should actually pay him less. And it's like, no, 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 guys, we have a value. You pay 50%. It just is what it is. Right. It is, it, and, and it almost comes down to, because of the emotional element of it, it is almost like getting a divorce if, if two related parties are at control of the company and can't agree on the future of the company. So let, let's, let's park that one. Let's Business is all about solving complex problems as fast as you can create them. Become the best problem solver by leading others to greatness too. And the first step is going to DougThorpe.com. Doug Thorpe is known globally for coaching entrepreneurs and business leaders, improving their performance and the work output of everyone surrounding them. You can find health, wealth, and happiness by learning to lead others to health, wealth, and happiness. Go to DougThorpe.com now and order Doug's books or hire him to coach your managers. That's Doug, T-H-O-R-P-E.com. What are some of the other scenarios that you've gotten involved in, Rachel? 
uh, new spouses are a really big one. So that that same scenario, except now we add in a new spouse, right? So maybe dad died, the two children are managing the company, but they're still supposed to be giving some kind of income or something to surviving spouse, and they can't. So having a surviving spouse that's not mom and dad, that's not, you know, not the natural parent, but maybe a second or third marriage, that's really challenging because they maybe have an inheritance share or an interest. Companies aren't always liquid. So that's one that I see that's really, really complicated. I see after somebody passes away, right? So now we have, it, it, you know, uh, maybe dad, we'll use dad. Dad started a company. He is vibrant. We didn't see his death coming, got into a car accident, dies. And what do we do with the company? Do we, how do we keep it afloat? Do we close it? Are there things in place to have this taken care of? Or are we going to be in court? That's another one that oftentimes can just plummet the value and the hard work. When we're dealing with, you know, non-death, non-transfer issues, I think the big issues that I often see are when we have two people that maybe opened a company, they can be siblings or family members, for the paperwork says one person is the owner, but they had this verbal agreement that they would, you know, be joint owners. One of them is doing all of the day-to-day -day work and, and the other one is not. And we find, we see conflict in, you know, I should be owner on paper. You should make this happen. I'm doing all of the work. You are not. And this push and pull of value I think in those situations, I know people do it for all of the reasons. I've heard all of the stories. Like I have to pay child support and I don't want the income and I don't want, I got divorced. I don't want my new spouse to get a hold of it. All of these reasons for not having the paperwork reflect the actual ownership and agreements. But it is a nightmare. Like it is absolutely a nightmare. The reality is, you know, people get afraid of contracts. They get afraid of ownership. They get afraid of doing these things because of the potential outfall. But when you're getting along, that's the time to have everybody sign the agreements because that's when they're going to be good. When you start having conflict and then you think I'm going to go and be like, hey, you said I was going to be a co-owner. I'd like you to sign that paperwork over. You think they're going to sign at that point? Definitely not. Now you have conflict. So that's a really, really common one that I think people don't understand. And I think it's because one person, typically one person forms the corporation, they do it, they get the ball rolling, they get into company operations and they oftentimes just forget to go back and, and split the ownership. But that's one that I think needs to be addressed. And then we have, even outside of an ownership issue, we have just hiring a family member to work for you, right? Not even paying them low wage, just hiring them and going from, and I did this, I made this mistake. I hired my mom and we had a great relationship before and she went on payroll and she uh, got paid a, a salary and we, we, were not, we were not successful in transitioning to boss employee relationship and maintaining a mother daughter relationship. And it, fell apart in the worst possible way. And it took, we were, I'm fortunate that we were able to recover from it, but even still it took, you know, two or three years before we could put it all past us and that. So I think there's so many com complex things that can come up with family ownership. And that's not to scare everybody away. It's just to be aware of it. So as you well, go through I, this, I, you can put in plans to uh, acknowledge them. Well, I, I think there's an important learning there. And at one point in time, I wrote an article about this when it came to familial involvement in business. There's, there's a map of five different possibilities of roles that somebody can take on in the company. And when you're talking about introducing a family member into the mix, one of the best things you can do is agree on what role they're going to play with which one of these boxes do they sit in or or overlap with and it's things like are you really the owner of this business or or who do you agree is the owner you know let's have that discussion and you you've got investor is another role that could be there you know 
Aunt Susie might have put up some money to help you get it started. Well, okay, what impact and influence does Aunt Susie get to have, you know, over this business? And then there is clearly the role of employee and, and you know, what is that about and so on. And it, it kind of goes on. And I think back to um, I started a company a number of years ago and my wife was interested in helping me with it. So first thing we did, we kind of took a look at the landscape and we carved out and and made it very clear which domain each one of us was going to be responsible for. And we came to our own agreement that when a decision is made in that one domain, the other one doesn't get to yak about it and, you know, snipe at it all the time. You know, we can talk about leading up to the decision, but then when the one who has the domain makes the decision, it's over, you know, move on. And we put that in play and that worked very well. Well, about two years into the business, our youngest son was going through some some of his own growth pains and came to us and said, I need a job. Can I work for you guys? And I actually had a need at the time that I could see him fulfilling, but I set him down and I said, yes, I will hire you, but here's the deal. When you walk through that door every morning, it's not mom and dad, it's, you know, boss and co-boss and, and you're not our son, you're an employee. You're going to be subject to the same expectations and disciplines that everybody else has. And I promise you, if you go sideways, you're going to be on the block, you know? And he agreed. He, he said, I get it. I understand what you're saying. Well, about 30 days in, he started testing <laughs> the, the boundaries. <laughs> and, uh, and I called him in and I said, you are now on a 30 day probation. You know, you, you have violated several company policies here and that puts you on probation. And over this next 30 days, if you don't lock it in and get it done, you're out. And he, I think was actually surprised that I would go that far, but he got it and he, you know, buckled down and pitched in and really got centered and focused. And it has ultimately led to, you know, his whole career standing where he is now. It was the foundation of his learning for the career that he's now pursuing in finance and banking. And um, uh, now that we're 20 years past all that, he, he frequently at family dinner says, best thing you ever did for me is, you know, lock my heels and get me focused on what I needed to be doing. And, um, so. Our, I have an 18 year old and she's gone back and forth. Uh, she's amazing. I, 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 she's surpassing me at 18 for sure. But she's oftentimes come in, you know, in between jobs or when she wanted extra money, asked if she could work for us. And when she graduated high school, she had that summer, she didn't really know what she was going to do and she didn't have a job. And I, I kind of said the same thing. I said, so you're, I'm going to be the boss. I am the boss. You're going to be my employee. And I said, and when you walk in, when you're at my office, I expect you to be there on time. You're, ex you're held to the same standards as all the other employees. But it's especially important for you. Her name's Kaya. I said, it's especially important for you, Kaya, because I can't make everybody else uncomfortable with you being around thinking, oh, well, that's the boss's daughter. So she gets away with it. You working here cannot affect the company morale. I have a very smart daughter. She decided not to take me up on my offer. And so we don't know how that would have played out. But I think that communication was really important that you had with your son, that I had with my daughter, just... Here is how it is, because I love you, but I can't, I can't have you, you know, ultimately when it comes to the business, the business is the goal. It has to be profitable. And I'm not here to, I'm not rich enough to, you know, fund your life forever. So I think that's really important. One last story um, for, on this topic, and of course we can go to whatever else, but I thought it was fun when you said you and your wife right? So my husband and I started a company called DIY Barbecue. It's still in existence and we co-ran it. And then I opened my firm. And at, 
that point I had to step away from DIY barbecue. And now every hill, we have the marital talks, right, about what should happen, you know, ideas, hardships that the companies are going through. But over the years, he's been like, Rachel, I want you to come back. I want you to come back. I want you to, you know, help me run this company. I want you to be here. And what I've learned, and it was a hard thing for me to learn, is that he needs to have his thing and I need to have mine because it didn't work for our marriage for me to come in and control that company or him to come in and try and control my law firm. So we stay very separate and I am very aware of what I can and cannot say from a business standpoint, even though I co-own the company, right? I'm a backseat. So I think, you know, I'm, Doug, you can tell me if you agree, but I think there's so much that goes on and some of the things that you've said are great. Some of my experiences hopefully are helpful, but everybody needs to be really aware of their relationship with the family members that they bring in and be willing to do what's necessary to maintain those relationships while maintaining the integrity of the business. And what I do with my husband and our companies may not work for other people, right? What right. you do with the separating powers, but the, the litigation always comes when people don't communicate and they're not willing to have those hard conversations. They're hard. There's nothing pleasant about telling your child they're going to be fired. Right? right? Right. But you have to. Well, and I, I think it does come down to the basic health of the relationship. And in, in the case of spouses, if, if that relationship is not great going in, trying to do the work is not going to make it better. It, it'll put a whole lot of other pressure on an already, you know, tenuous situation. And so um, I, I, th I think that's probably the, the word of it. And I'm, I'm thinking of a story. Uh, there was a, a gentleman who owned a very successful business. Uh, he was in a roundtable group of mine a couple of years ago. And at one of the roundtable meetings, he said, uh, I'm thinking about bringing my wife back into the business. And we go, what do you mean back in? And he said, well, she worked with me for a while and we just, it, it started making everything funky. And we just agreed that she was going to leave and get out of the business and go back home. But now things have gone on and she's, you know, kids are grown and gone and she's looking for stuff to do. And, and we've been talking about bringing her back and we're going, no, <laughs> it, if it didn't work the first time, it's not going to work the second time. What are you thinking? You know? So, um, he, uh, he, he thought about it and went and had a nice heart to heart and they figured out another thing she could get into that would suffice and the business didn't need to be the uh, the place that that was going to be accomplished so it was a it was a good outcome apparently so yeah it's funny i feel like it's kind of like when people say i'm my marriage sucks so we're going to have a kid yeah <laughs> what no this is not going to solve the problem <laughs> right <laughs> right, exactly. Well, Rachel, we're about up on time, and I really appreciate you sitting in and sharing all this with us. Tell folks the best way to get a hold of you if they're interested in knowing more. I am on all the socials at The Lawyer King. My website is thelawyerking.com. I would love for everybody to reach out and ask a question. I'm happy to answer. It's been such a pleasure to be on this show, and hopefully, you know, if there's one takeaway, I would say prevent you doing things before the conflict arises in a business is always more helpful. And having conversations before the conflict arises, even when they're hard, is really important. And if you're not able to have those conversations or take those preventative steps, then I think reevaluating the decision that you're making is probably really important. Agreed. Very good word. So folks, as always, we're going to have Rachel's links in our show notes. So just uh, click down there and uh, mash any of the links and you can get her information. And with that, we're going to bring this thing to a close, let you go out there and make it a great day. Thanks for listening in. We look forward to seeing you again soon. You've been listening to Leadership Powered by Common Sense, hosted by Doug Thorpe. 
If you would like to know more about the coaching and advisory services he provides, visit DougThorpe.com.